So I am Kenetta Hammond Perry, and I serve as director of the Stephen Lawrence Research Center. And I'd like to welcome everyone today uh, to the Stephen Lawrence Research Center's launch of its new webinar series, um, The Exchange. Um, this is a new platform for us um, where we're aiming to reach a broad audience with cutting edge research, um, information and debate that can shape how we think about um, race, racism and the ongoing quest for social justice. Um, in the wake of ongoing protests in the aftermath of George Floyd's murder, which themselves are really set against the backdrop of a public health crisis that's seen its highest death rates um, experienced disproportionately um, impacting Black, Asian, and minority ethnic communities in the UK. We are really witnessing, I think, a global critique of the ways in which questions around state power and racial injustice are intimately linked to questions around health and well-being. Writing nearly four decades ago in a chapter titled The Uncaring Arms of the State, which appeared as part of their groundbreaking 1985 text, The Heart of the Race, Beverly Bryan, Stella Dodzi, and Suzanne Scaife observed, good health is not merely the absence of illness and disease. It is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. Whether we are healthy, therefore, is determined almost exclusively by our working conditions, the standard of our housing, our access to health and welfare services, and the treatment we receive from them. In offering these observations, these scholars highlighted the fact that when we are looking at disproportionate health outcomes, we are in fact witnessing a wider social, political, and economic index of a set of systems which have failed to deliver adequate health services, opportunities, and justice in such a manner that equitably meets the needs and entire, the entire needs of a community and segments of society. So I really think that these insights provide a useful starting point for understanding the connections between health and racial inequality in the UK. And today we are joined with what I consider to be an all-star panel of leading academics and public health professionals to talk through some of these um, issues and to share some of the research that's going on um, in these areas. So by way of introduction, we have with us uh, Professor Heidi Sophia Mirza, who is an Emeritus Professor of Equality Studies at UCL's Institute of Education and a visiting professor of race, faith, and culture at Goldsmiths College at the University of London. As a daughter of the Windrush generation, Heidi is known for her pioneering intersectional research on race, gender, and identity in education. She's author of several best-selling books, including Young, Female, and Black, which was voted in the top 40 most influential educational studies in Britain. Um, she's also a leading voice in the global debate on decolonization and recently co-edited the flagship book, Dismantling Race in Higher Education, Racism, Whiteness, and Decolonizing the Academy. Currently, she is co-authoring the race and ethnicity section of the IFS Deaton Inequality Review, which includes an investigation into the disproportionate effects of COVID-19 on our Black uh, and minority ethnic communities in the UK. Next, we have Dr. Natalie Darko, who is a research fellow and academic lead at the Center of Black Minority, uh, Black minority uh, Ethnic Health at the University of Leicester. She has over 15 years experience in academia and her current research interests and projects focus on investigating the health, well-being, health intervention delivery and actions to address health inequalities experienced by black and minority ethnic communities. Dr. Jarko has an established uh, track record of working with black and minority ethnic community led um, organizations and charity groups with an interest in health inequality and ethnic health. Um, she currently acts as co-chair and steering committee member for a number of research community groups, including the University of Leicester's Migration, Mobility, and Citizenship Group. And as part of her current portfolio of work, she's delivering a study that examines the impact of COVID-19 on the health and well-being of Black and minority ethnic uh, communities. She's also uh, leading a research project that investigates the equality and inclusivity practices of health researchers, which I think is is really uh, important um, work there. 
Uh, next, we have with us uh, Professor Ivan Brown, who's a professor of public health practice at De Montfort University and currently serves as director of public health for Leicester City Council, where he is leading in the local authorities' response to COVID-19 and working to address persistent inequalities in health and social care in Leicester. Um, Professor Brown has worked as a consultant in public health within the city of Leicester since 2008. Um, and before that time, he worked with, uh, before that time he was working with the city of Leicester, he carried out public health training within the West Midlands region and previously worked in a regional public health team dedicated to address, addressing risks posed by chemical and environmental hazards on health of um, populations. One of the things that you'll notice today um, is that, again, as with technology, um, we have to be open to that. And right now you don't see uh, Professor Brown, but he is in the room. Um, he, we're having some technical difficulties with the camera there, but he is very much in the room and very much a part of this conversation. So we <coughs> welcome you. Uh, lastly, we have Professor Bertha O'Cheng, who's a professor of integrated health and social care at De Montfort University. Um, she is both an academic and an activist who has an extensive experience of health and social care provision as a clinician, as an academic, and as a researcher working with community groups and service providers. Her research focus is on improving population health and well being through the provision of high quality education and research that provides positive results to marginalized and socially disadvantaged populations throughout uh, the lifespan of those communities. Her work has resulted in collaborations with voluntary organizations, health and social care teams, nationally and internationally. And her research portfolio includes co creation of self care strategies for maintaining well-being, community empowerment, and engagement to enable the voices of marginalized and socially disadvantaged populations to be heard in the planning and delivery of services. So I am again pleased and, and really thrilled to have um, this panel of experts um, who are practitioners, who are thinkers, but also working within communities to address these issues on the terms of those communities. So I'm, I'm just really excited to do that. In terms of our format today, we're going to have each of our panelists sort of offer some opening um, framing uh, comments for about five to seven minutes, and then we're going to transition uh, to a bit of a moderated discussion between the panelists, and then we're going to reserve some time at the very end of the hour to entertain some of the questions that you have as audience members um, that you might want to pose to our panelists here today. So we're going to go ahead um, and get started, and I'm going to turn uh, right away to uh, Professor Mirza. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be in this chat room. It's uh, new experiences for us. And um, I have to admit that it's been a very difficult and deeply emotional journey getting myself prepared for this seminar. It's been weeks in lockdown. Um, and the world seems to be exploding while we can't take part. Somebody like me who has to stay indoors. It has been a very difficult time. And to talk about something so visceral as our Black minority ethnic communities that are being devastated by COVID-19 is something that, um, you know, is not an easy thing to do. And I think that a lot of the reports that have come out recently don't really respect or understand the burden that we feel having to talk about it, having to experience it and having to live it. Um, so many people have just been calling me up, many white friends saying, Heidi, tell me what to do as a white person. How can we make it better? How can we um, uh, understand the issues that are going on in the world, both with the violence that's erupted in America from the violence that is perpetrated on the African American people too, as black and minority ethnic people. Um, you know, the it's not something new. And I know everyone in this room have, um, and including the audience, have been around for a while in seeing the violence that have had uh, in our communities. And I remember in 1981, um, the, the, Brixton, the Brixton uprisings, very similar to what we have now, but without social media, it did spread across time, 
but it didn't it didn't have the impact that we're seeing at the moment and what i want to do is talk a bit about how we can peel away what i would like to think of the covid experience as an onion and peel off different layers to find out what is at the root cause for the way in which um, COVID is affecting our community, but also the way it's being talked about in the media and the press and the politicians. One of the things um, I was saying was that lots of my white friends have asked me about what I'm, what's going on and for me to help them to understand things. But um, I want to talk about um, a friend of mine who said to me, um, Heidi, um, I've told him I was doing some research with the um, Institute for Fiscal Studies looking at the BME um, issues in our community. And he said, well, surely it's just genetic. Surely it's um, it's not a problem. Um, uh, it's something that we can deal with. Um, it's lack of vitamin D or too much obesity or um, heart disease in your communities. And, and that's fixable wanted it to be fixed and i just want to raise this issue as part of the onion that we need to peel away it's the it's the issue that or the urban myth that somehow we're genetically prone to covid i think it's a serious issue um because what it does it ends up blaming the victim we can ch you know we have some kind of pathology some kind of inherent um proneness to the disease and genetics creeps in all the time when we talk about race and there's a long history around race um, from the enlightenment period um, you know, racial categorizations that were then um, challenged after the holocaust by unesco who said well actually we cannot use racial classifications and racial ideas of deep ethnic difference and then and racialized difference and then by the time um, we are now in where we have concepts um, the human genome project which showed that actually there's very little genetic difference between people between groups of people and i think that that is the, the idea that genetics can creep in and actually grip the explanations politically and socially is something that we need to really resist. Um, because what it does is it masks the social deprivation, the social inequalities um, that racialized communities experience in Britain. And we experience in that, them because of the relationship that we've had with Britain throughout the centuries as indentured and enslaved people, as migrants without any um, rights, um, recourse to public funds or um, citizenship rights in Britain. This long history is because of that, that where we are now. Um, the, we were asked by um, Kenetta to talk about the Public Health England um, report. And I have this to say, when I read it, it was part of the emotional journey for me. I just felt so objectified and disrespected by that report. It was all about figures and facts as if we're not human beings. And this objectification comes from the idea of, and, and I'm going to quote um, a very well-known um, white um, social theorist called Durkheim, one of the great white um, thinkers, male thinkers that often are challenged. But, you know, he talked about suicide in, in in society as a social fact and it's a but it's made up of very different um personal experiences by people or in different historical times yet we give it a name and that's what racism and covid is about it's about creating it as a social fact and we need to strip away what truth is it's not just a thing that exists out there it's a creation, it's a social construction. Um, though it is real, the conditions for it are something that we have to um, we have to challenge. I realize I'm taking over the time, but um, uh, so the questions that I have is, 
to what extent is it about our living conditions? We're told in the reports um, continuously that it's about that we live in London where we're more crowded and overcrowded, that it's to do with our age, but for our populations, it's actually for younger people. And when we think about the young, um, uh, you know, the young man who died, uh, Ismail Mohammed Abdul Rahib, he was 13 years old. He was the youngest person, young man to die of, of COVID. And then we're told it's our jobs. Yes, it is our jobs. We are key workers. We do um, health and social care. And we are the doctors on the front line and the nurses on the front line. So I just want to say that we are in this position because of the conditions in which we have been politically and socially constructed and positioned. And the way out of this isn't just simply through genetics or through the idea of our difference. We have to have a, a sense of our emotions driving it, but a sense of what Audre Lord calls righteous anger at the injustices. Um, that, and in order to do that, in order to have a righteous anger, we need to, to if you like, um, struggle against the way in which we are being labeled, stereotyped and constructed through this, this, this new disease. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I think you put a lot on, on the table that we'll, we'll be able to unravel. I definitely like the idea of the onion and sort of thinking through uh, needing to unravel the different layers that we're, we're looking at here. Um, I'm going to now turn to um, Natalie um, for, for you to give us some, some sort of opening comments to help frame the discussion. Hi, thank you, Heidi. That was really useful and insightful. I guess um, I think it might be useful if I just tell you a bit about my role within the Centre for BME Health and the work that we're currently doing and some of the work that I'm leading, which Kenetta mentioned, about COVID-19 and um, racial equality qualities. Because I guess coming back to the onion, the, the purpose of my role is to ensure that we improve research with, with underrepresented groups, so black and minority ethnic groups, but doing that to make sure that we're included more in research studies, in clinical trials, and all spheres of research to make sure that we get more data, but also more understanding the lived experiences of people, particularly at times like this during COVID when those voices are seldom heard and often misunderstood and neglected, particularly in the light of the PhD report. So some of the work that I'm doing at the moment, as Kenetta mentioned, is a, a survey at the moment looking at people's attitudes and beliefs about COVID-19, but also the impact of this terrible situation on people's lives, but mainly health and well-being. So physical health, mental health and well-being. And in trying to make sure that we do more research to, that represents everybody and that doesn't include exclude people. And what commonly happens in particularly health research is groups that are not different minority groups are often marginalised and neglected or perceived as hard to reach um, and left out of studies. And then there isn't enough information to kind of allow people to express the the injustices they may feel, or difficulties in accessing health care or the problems they face with different health outcomes. So also looking at social isolation. And other parts of my work in particular is to look at the qualitative experiences or the lived experiences of, of difficult times. So it might be the windrush period. At the moment, I'm left talking to people affected by the windrush and also people who've moved from the Caribbean and the impacts of COVID-19 on their lives. So those who are already facing inequalities, structural, social, economic inequalities, and how this is now affecting them. And also within the centre, a big part of which I think we're going to talk about today is making sure that there is community involvement, working with groups of people that are less represented in health, research, who don't have the capacity to engage, making sure they're involved and also making sure that they're understood and not misunderstood. So trying to get that information across to commissioners, um, those that need to listen to our voices. And so that's a key area of my research, basically, and also the work within the centre and trying to encourage 
more people to not marginalize our voices, marginalize the experiences of healthcare workers, everybody experiencing the pandemic who feels underrepresented. And also importantly, trying to understand the impact of racial equality and kind of capturing that. So that's the key role within my work, basically. And in terms of COVID-19, one of the things that I think is most apparent working in the Centre for BME Health is we have community workers within our team that are generally out in the communities in normal circumstances and work with different groups, faith-based, BME-led organisations, individuals, health groups. One of the things that obviously we do a lot of is community-based work and to have limited access to that provision or healthcare delivery on the ground is really difficult for people who already face structural inequalities and, and differentiated health outcomes. So to not have access to those faith-based deliveries, community engagement activities is really troubling at this time. So I'm hoping that the discussions today will try and raise awareness of that. So thank you and I look forward to the questions later. Thank you, thank you for that, thank you. I'm gonna now turn um, to Ivan. Um, and for those, I don't know if, if people have um, just recently joined us and weren't um, here for the introductions. Uh, Professor Ivan Brown um, is with us today, but his camera is not working, but he's he's part of the conversation. And um, I wanna turn to, uh, to him. Thank you very much. Um, don't let the darkness worry you. Um, <laughs> It looks very much like my Facebook profile at the moment. Um, so, so what I would say is I, I'm going to talk about um, public health uh, from a population point of view. Um, but before I do, what I would really want to do is I want to take you on a bit of a journey because we often talk about populations, but populations are people. Uh, and I'm going to share with you a little bit of my own journey uh, because it's, it's probably a journey that's familiar to many. So... Uh, my family is Windrush family, um, very familiar story. Uh, you know, my father left the warm, balmy island of Antigua, um, really to pursue a better life over here. Uh, my mom was recruited uh, back in Antigua. She went to London to become a nurse and worked for many years as a senior sister within the health system. Uh, they met, they got married, and the whole thing was about uh, something being better. That journey, the goal was about health and wealth and happiness. So when I start to look at where we're at on that, I, I often think for our populations, the question that we, we raise is, how is that working out for us? How has that been for us? Uh, and I thought what was really interesting, and I don't know whether anybody else has done this, but when you type black health into many search engines and NHS mm. health, um, search engines, what you mm. get is a whole liturgy of deficit, a whole liturgy of what is wrong. So they'll talk to you around mental health, they'll talk to you about hypertension, they'll talk to you about many, many issues as if somehow there is something wrong with us. You, you type, uh, white health and you don't get the same picture that comes up so for me there is a question that i have to raise about what what happens how is that narrative working through and what does that mean in practice then the first thing that i would say as a public health person of course is and a, a public health person working here is health is not the nhs um health is not defined within the nhs health uh, the main determinants of health lie well outside of that. Yes, there are those hereditary factors. And there are individual lifestyle factors, but a huge part of it is about social and community networks. A huge part of it is around socioeconomic and cultural and environmental conditions. Huge parts around work opportunities, around education, uh, around unemployment. All of these things are the things that fit into health. And I found it quite interesting talking or listening to the narrative that's taken place in relation to the PHE report, talking about uh, um, we, we've changed the terms now, haven't we? We don't we don't we don't call it inequalities anymore. We call it disparity. Um, but talking about race disparity um, as if this is something that is a shock to us. But I would just refer you to a cabinet office paper that 
also got quite a lot of attention back in 2017, which talked about the race disparity audit. Um, uh, Theresa May uh, uh, got that in place, asked for that, and it showed lots of things that we already knew. Um, so this is this is this is a reiteration of things that we are we are already aware of, and all of the, these things came and told us about. I think we may be deprivation. Losing. It talked to us about okay. the lack of opportunity. Think of my city. Um, Seventy-six percent of, of of my city live in the forty percent most deprived. Um, areas nationally and and that has an impact um and that that has an impact on our population because over 50 percent of my from is is not from a, a white background um so i i recognize that there are some huge challenges for us uh, as a city a huge Huge challenges to face. I can. I think that I might be breaking up, and I apologise for that. It's uh, poor Wi-Fi at my end. But what I'm trying to say very briefly is, it is broader. It is about social justice. It's about education. It's about housing. It's about access to services. It's about many, many things. Uh, and to and to, to to paraphrase Martin Luther King, he said, "Call it democracy, or call it democratic socialism." But there must be a better distribution of wealth within this country for all of God's children. And that's the big battle that we continue to face. Thank you. Thank you for um, thank you for those comments. I'm going to now turn to um, to Bertha to just round this out in terms of our some opening comments. Thank you, Kaneta. And thank you for this uh, for the seminar that you've organized, which is really timely. Uh, my focus is actually going to be slightly similar to what uh, Ivan has been talking about from a public health and social care perspectives. When the revelation started emerging that uh, black and minority ethnic workers were dying in disproportionate numbers as a result of the COVID crisis, I too was surprised. But I was surprised by the fact that nobody would actually have thought that this was like, it was not going to happen. I, mm -hmm. In, in terms of this was going to be an, an inevitable consequence of the crisis that has been plaguing with us for the last 40, 50 years since the Windrush generation. So I was surprised that others were surprised. That is where my surprise was. Any of us who's actually within the field of ethnicity, health and social care would not have been surprised at all. Because just taking you through a journey in terms of a public health journey, when we go back to 1980, at the time of the publication of the Black Report in the 1980s, it articulated much more clearly how social and economic disadvantages lead to health inequalities. That particular report showed in great detail the extent of which ill health and death and unequally distributed among the population of Britain. And it suggested a raft of strategies, social and healthcare measures that could be undertaken. But within that particular time, the Secretary of State for Social Services at that time completely disavowed the report and very few copies were printed and few people had the opportunity to read it. This report, although it is 40 years old, still speaks to us now. Mm -hmm. Since then, there have been a number of reports articulating and regurgitating the same issues. And I'll come to the public health, the most recent public health report now. We should not be surprised that over 60% of the NHS workers who've lost their lives because of COVID-19 are actually from the black and minority ethnic communities. Now, others may be surprised because what is happening now within those statistics that we are very much mindful of, we are starting to see the names and the faces of the communities behind those statistics that rarely are demonstrated in, uh, when we look at statistics themselves. Now, just looking at the report itself, I'm not saying that we should not be having a further report. You know, this is all very well because we've had countless inquiries, countless recommendations, countless reports, and that's fine because what it does is identify where risk areas are and what we can do about those. But that should not say that that situation should not be assessed or action taken. 
But whatever that needs to be done and to be addressed are those wider social, economic, and political factors that have left black and minority ethnic families and communities to be desperate and vulnerable during this particular pandemic. If these factors are not addressed, if the social discrimination is not addressed, the fabric of discrimination that is there within those systems is not addressed, then what becomes common currency, as we are seeing now, is the idea that black and minority ethnic people at a, are at a higher risk of COVID-19 simply because of who they are. Mm -hmm. you know, something that the majority of us, the whole community is proud of. So given the fact that I'm a black and a minority ethnic community, that's what it's reduced to. And that reduction model is not helpful to us at all. We need to be challenging those structures of discrimination and those racism. And what COVID has exposed to us in the words of Professor Sam Mike, uh, Michael Marmot is that we cannot and we must not go back to that particular status quo. We cannot do that. I'm not calling for a revolution or anything like that, but for a disruption of the system. It's really important that we do that. Otherwise, the same pandemic and again, similar issues we're going to come across and the same numbers and those moms and dads and brothers and sisters that we have been seeing their photos day and day in our media in terms of the 63% who have died isn't going to get worse. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for uh, for just sort of uh, all of you all helping us kind of frame some of those issues. I, I want to just kind of drill down a little bit on all of you all kind of talked in different ways to, um, you know, obviously we have this report that came out and, and there's, you know, I don't think there's a there's not a lot. I know no one on this panel is necessarily shocked by that um, to some extent or wasn't necessarily expecting it. But I think I was reading something over the weekend, one of the reports that was come, policy papers coming out of Bristol um, that was talking about, you know, it's, we need to be paying attention to what the report can't tell us. And the, the questions about what what are the questions that need to be asked? What are the types of, of data that we need to sort of be asking? What are the methods that we need to be using to collect data? That definitely sort of resonates with some of what Natalie was saying. And, and it draws me back to a point um, that Ruha Benjamin talks about in her work. She talks about the datafication of injustice, where she basically says, all we do is continue to ask for more data, more data, more data for the things that we already know. Um, data that's already tainted because, you know, even the categories by which we're collecting that data aren't really telling us anything. Um, if we think about racial and ethnic categories, they're not allowing us to really get to the nub of these issues. So I'm curious, you know, I'm just gonna sort of, um, first sort of begin with Natalie. I'm, I'm curious um, what you think in terms of the work that you all are doing at uh, the Center for Black and Minority Health at the University of, of Leicester. How are you all challenging um, the kinds of reporting that we kind of get, we're kind of used to now, like the reporting that's gonna tell us about a particular kind of disparity that's connected with black, uh, Asian and minority ethnic communities in the UK. How, how do we push back against that? But also at the same time, how do we make sure that the voices and experiences of these communities are represented in, in the questions that we're asking? Thanks, Kinesa. I think this is my key element of my work. I think the most the most important thing to me is, which which I looked at straight away when I looked at the report, is the, the missing data on ethnicity. When you look at the actual figures for some of the data collected, we're still, there's still no information on ethnicity. I, I looked at the figures of approximately 3,500 under one of the particular um, stat, 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 stats regarding death, recording of death from COVID-19. So what's happening? Why, why are we still going around in circles that we're not recording ethnicity data? There are circumstances in healthcare that we know that it's difficult to um, access ethnicity data. But from the work that I've been involved in, there's still challenges in the lack of understanding and kind of a lack of cultural competency in asking people about their ethnicity and ensuring that the, the categories we use are understood and also recorded properly. There's a kind of fear of asking about ethnicity or race and misunderstanding between the concepts of ethnicity and race and also the, the standard classification, standard practice of putting everybody into one category, the black category or the BME category, which lumps all 
um, people from different ethnic backgrounds and racial groups together. So by doing that, and even in particular reports, as we've just mentioned, you kind of marginalize and, or you kind of bring together a whole group of people, assuming that all their experiences of structural inequalities and the wider determinants of health have impacted on them in the same way when that's not the case. And I think but that's the key area that we need to address within healthcare recording, making sure importantly that ethnicity is recorded, making sure that vaccine studies, clinical trials record ethnicity, making sure that there's an understanding between clinicians, health researchers, all those involved of the difference between ethnicity and race, to avoid those racializations which, which were previously mentioned by others earlier. So I think that's the most important thing, improving the education and not assuming that one identity is categorised under a particular category. So that's really important. But also, most importantly, and I guess the, the, the challenges that we faced with the PH, PHE report and the exclusion of lots of the comments from BME members, community organisations, we need to understand the lived experiences and the community voices to be able to understand what's, what the impact is. As we said earlier, there's there's, oh, there's lots of data. We already know the data that's been produced in the report. We just need to understand more about people's experiences and the other factors that come into play. And most importantly, what's missed commonly is the, the intersectionality of that, not assuming that we just collect data on one aspect or one protected characteristic and then ethnicity or race. So look at social disadvantage and deprivation and then just look at COVID-19 and then a person's ethnicity and race. It's about understanding all those intersections that come into play that impact on a person that has made their health outcomes different from somebody else's and also impacts on their access to healthcare. And most importantly, improving the education within healthcare provision on how to, to how to treat, work with, engage different minority populations and underrepresented uh, individuals and making sure that their practice is culturally competent. Once we get to that and improve understanding, I think that that's an essential starting point. And you have to do that from the individuals, the numbers of people that have been affected, rather than just coming back to the stats every time. So I hope that answers the question. So I don't know if anyone else is bad. Yeah, and I'll just, I just add to your point, Natalie. Um, you know, I push back Kaneta a little bit on that 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 opening statement because I think we have to recognise that data is currency, and it's not mm. just about collecting data; mm. it's about collecting the right data, mm. and some of that data is basic. So, for example, how can we be in a situation where ethnicity is not recording on a death certificate? Mm. I mean, that is just bizarre because what that means is that we can't often do some of the most basic of analysis just on the most definitive outcome, death. Mm. Um, so it is about how do we how do we fight back in relation to that? Uh, mm. and, and so we're not we're talking about some of the big stuff here. We're talking about some of the basic things that we definitely need to have in place. And I and I and I get um, Natalie's point about the danger of just rolling everything together. Okay. So you know, you know, we we're now going to look at we're going to now look at ethnicity, like it's just this mm homogenous mass um so you know there are there are questions where we're having to drill down further and saying what is that different what is that impact of some of that injustice that we see on different um populations that, that sit out there because we can have that that kind of masking effect if we if we don't do that so how do we know how to target our resources i have a I, i'm thinking from a practical point of view as a public health director i have a finite budget it is small compared to the challenge. So there's this issue about equity, equality and justice. And I am having to work out where do I spend my pound to get the maximum input? Mm -hmm. If I don't have the data, I might have a gut feeling. I might say that I know. But actually to get that over the line, to say that I am now going to invest here, I need the information, I need data, it is important. Mm -hmm. I, I think the way, uh, thank you for that, uh, uh, Ivan and Natalie. Also. I think for me, 
my immediate reaction in the matter in, in the manner in which the data was actually presented was the, the reductive approach in which it actually focuses on um, individual's behavior rather than those wider social determinants of health. And that is where it actually fails. We are now in a, in, in a world that technology, we've got all sorts of technology that perhaps could actually overlay some of those inequalities. You look at those data, and then you look at where the socioeconomic aspects of black and minority ethnic families and individuals are the discrimination that they're facing. And then you, you analyze them together to provide you with a clear linkage of why this disproportionate aspect of it is actually existing. But also to be able to present data in such a manner that those communities are able to also consume and understand and question and push through. I recall about six or seven months ago, I was speaking within a community event and sharing some data of obesity with black and minority ethnic individuals. And they were surprised in the sense that they kept saying, this is unbelievable. This data is so high. And that's what we need to do as researchers also and as academics. How do we share that information with our communities where we are? How do we make that information accessible to them so that it doesn't wait for academics just speaking with each other and looking mm -hmm. at that data? That data has been collected for the last 500 years we've been collecting those data and we continue doing that. I'm not saying that we should not do that, but it cannot be seen in isolation. It has to be seen within that wider social determinants of health if really we are going to bridge that, those gaps of inequalities in health and preparing for the next pandemic because this is just the first of it. I was going to ask um, Heidi if you wanted to jump in on that point too, particularly because I know you're involved in one of the, the major national efforts around um, tracking disparities in terms of the impact of COVID-19. And I'm curious, given that you are with your, your work in sociology, I mean, uh, in many ways, uh, historical sociology, so you are very well versed in sort of thinking about um, the, the larger sociological and historical factors that we're seeing at work um, in terms of looking at the outcomes that we're looking at now, how does your voice fit into that kind of, of work around data collection and around, um, you know, reporting on, on these outcomes that we're looking at now? It's a really, a really difficult subject, data collection, because in order to collect data on um, people of different ethnicities and different genders and classes, you have to categorize them, which means that you have to, in fact, use racial, racialized groupings. So you reinforce racial difference. But that racial difference, if we didn't measure it, if we didn't monitor it, um, would go unchecked and the inequalities would not would not be obvious to us. But what I want to say about this, what I call the white heat of it just of reports and data and more and more data. And everybody came through everybody's talk just now. How much more data do we need to show the inequality and where they are? We know where they are. We know where they are in the cities, which cities they are in, more likely Birmingham and London, where ethnic minorities live, or Leicester, certain sections of the city. We know where it is. We know which ethnic groups. We know where the Bangladeshis, what, what issues have are for them. Um, we know that Black Africans, what issues for them specifically about being key workers on the front line. We know... We know things. We know that Caribbean people are older and more likely to, um, uh, to to die at an older age, but the other groups are more likely, especially Black Africans, to be younger. And we know these things. So what more can data do? And for me, this is going back, I, I did mention, you know, this idea of, of, um, of COVID and these studies becoming a social fact. Um, becoming a, a, a tangible thing, and I want to I want to talk about data as being the known knowns. It's the known the things that we know, the things that we are tangible, the social facts. But what we don't know is the known unknowns. <laughs> I don't want to be like an American politician here, but the known unknowns where the inequalities really happen 
in maybe in a GP surgery, in an interaction, mm -hmm. or um, the way you are assessed or spoken to, so you don't go back to a place. I mean, when I was pregnant with my daughter some time ago, and, and I was, it just came to me when I was reading um, a few days ago that a, um, a black and minority ethnic women, 55% um, of all pregnant women um, with COVID are from black and minority ethnic communities. That is phenomenal. <laughs> I mean, um, I can see a question coming up on the chat, you know, is it not a public health emergency? Um, you know, this disproportionality of deaths or um, or, or of um, infection and, and so on. Is it not a scandal? And when I um, was having my daughter, I was actually pregnant um, with, uh, I'm sorry, not pregnant, I was pregnant, but I had toxemia and went and uh, it developed into preeclampsia. And uh, for those of you in the health area, you will know that you get very big and very swollen with oedema. And, and I went to the hospital and they thought that I couldn't speak English. They assumed that. They thought that I was just um, an overweight um, migrant woman. And they sat me down and um, left me in a room for 13 hours. Um, and uh, and I was in labor and I nearly died. I nearly went into a coma and I was saved at the last minute um, by a Pakistani doctor who rushed in and said, get her into surgery. But they tell you this story because the it was the way that I was socially constructed in that room um, when I went in all the belief systems. And, and, and I think, Natalie, you mentioned cultural competence. The way cultural competence is taught in in our health training is so blunt and so, um, oh, let's get to know what their habits are in these strange communities. We're not strange. We are urban people. We are just like everyone else. You know, there is a sense in which I feel pathologized by those things. And what happened to me was a result of not, of, of the, crudeness of the way we are constructed in the health system so it's just this balance between data and the realities of how we're treated yeah, yeah. and I, so just to add to that point i think there's some some questions came up in the live comments as well is and i guess the most important thing is moving away from a blame culture and moving away from the stereotyping that leads people to distrust engaging in health services or health research. I know there was a question posted to me about this and I think it's trying to address that. There was a question about blame culture and are we going to be blamed for attending protests as the result for the um, COVID um, number of COVID diagnosis and deaths going up? Will, will they blame ethnic minorities? And I think we just need to get control of the narrative and try to help address that in any way that we can so that we can encourage people to to want to participate in research and make particularly Ivan's jobs easier, Ivan's job easier and cheaper as well. But I think it's really important that we do address the blame culture that's potentially going to come out of the PHE report and other current activities at the moment. Yeah. Ivan, I did want to, to jump back in to you just to kind of talk. We're, we're in Leicester and I wanted to kind of get a view from Leicester about these big issues that are, you know, national and to some extent international. Um, what is the view from, you know, your role and, and, and that response? I mean, we, one of the things that you, we can definitely sort of talk about is that the key role that uh, local authorities are going to have to or have always had to play, but are definitely, you know, playing in this role. And I'm just curious about if you can tell us a little bit more about um, and give us some insights into how your role um, and, and all of the responsibilities that go along with that, what, what has that looked like um, in the last yeah. couple of months? Okay, I think that that's really a, a great question. So uh, I think for me, and things we've got to, to be mindful of is that, you know, for a long time, many of us have been banging the drum, you know, uh, lots of us have been trying to generate change. Um, and doing that at the coalface, uh, you know, but I'll tell you, mine is about putting things into practice. So I don't consider myself particularly an academic, I consider myself somebody who's trying to make some of this stuff live. 
and and one of the things that, that has has come is how difficult it can be to have those conversations at times um the, the kind of pushback that you get and that's why i do say that i use data as 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 currency i do use it as a as a bargaining chip but what i would say at the moment just the sheer scale of the change that is needed to bring about um uh, to address this i mean there was a question in the chat that was that spoke about um what you can you do in your community what can you do in your city in chapel town I, I studied up in leeds at one time so i know i know the area well um and what i would say is at this moment there has never been a better time to ask the question mm -hmm. so before i am going i'm saying well look we're, we're seeing we're seeing you know disparities across our city etc this is now you can the questions can be really pointed the questions because it, it's going to need whole scale change it's not something that can be delivered by public health it's not something that can be delivered by the nhs we are talking about systematic wholesale change now that's big because a lot of people don't want things to change you know or not necessarily from a from a from a negative but it's hard it's it's difficult stuff and it's it means that in order to 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 move things from one place it often means that people that have had it before may feel that i actually that's being taken away from me but when you see the outcomes that we're seeing writ large uh, across our community the, the the question comes back so what are we going to do about that mm -hmm in a tangible way and, and not well we're looking to another report i know tangibly what are we going to do in the next six months one year what are we going to do that starts to to move that that dial and i think that is a reasonable question now from anybody because this is not this is not an angry black person you know this is what you are seeing in front of you on the news every day this is what you're seeing in terms of outcomes. So it is remiss of us if we don't ask the question and that's irrespective of your race. I think that anybody now, when they're watching this and looking at the way that that disproportional impact that we see, be it in the social, you know, be it in the health system, be it in the um, criminal justice system, be it in, there are serious questions now to be asked. And now is the point to ask the questions. Mm -hmm. So one of the other, um, really quickly before we just kind of um, take a few more questions from the um, from our audience here, I just wanted to just really uh, ask this question about the role of universities and academic researchers, um, particularly those of us trained to think critically about race and racism. What what is the role that that we have to play um, in these conversations right now to help join up? Some of these conversations that um, that Ivan was talking about in terms of thinking about wholesale systematic change, meaning that you know it's not just something that the NHS needs to solve with the public, the director of public health, but the pub director of public health needs to be in conversation with social services and the education system and housing and the Ministry of Housing. You know, how do what is the role of of uh, the university and 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 knowledge exchange and knowledge production in all of that in this moment? Mm -hmm. I think I think it's really important, particularly in light of the protests and everything, that we don't treat every situation related to racial inequality in isolation. To argue that one incident or an issue where there's protest and this has happened as an injustice within one system should be treated in isolation from other factors. People are involved in the criminal justice system or have had interaction for any way, whether it's stop or search, have have also have health differentiated health outcomes or have the face the wider determinants of health in other aspects so all of those academics working in different disciplines should be coming more together to look at transdisciplinary research so i think it's on us to make sure that our research grants our studies our activities work with individuals like um professor brown in public health we also work across disciplines to ensure that we don't treat the experiences in isolation. So health along with other academic departments need to work together to address the issues that Ivan's just mentioned. Mm -hmm. And I also think, just to add to that, Kenneth, I also think that as researchers, we need to be very vigilant. 
because, and the reason why I'm saying that we need to be very vigilant, especially at this particular time, is that the, the pandemic has disrupted people's ways of life. It's also disrupted how researchers work with minority communities. I certainly know, and Ivan would say this, we had to stop a piece of work that we were doing with communities within Leicester, and that has had to be shelved for the next six months. Now, that is a really important piece of work in terms of community engagement and getting those kinds of feedback. Now, we need to be vigilant so that it doesn't become a security issue, that the security issue supersedes the kind of research that needs to be done. And any research that we are doing has got to be underlined and looked at this particular wider social determinants of health that affect those marginalized communities. Because that's where we are now starting to see that we cannot do this because of socialized uh, distancing. You cannot do this because of uh, the regulations that have been put in place because of the COVID-19. And that should not be seen as an excuse of not being able to undertake some real important work and research within the communities that we are working with taking forward. If that is not done, those, those inequalities in health are actually going to widen and they are already widening within that instance. So the, from an education perspective, we've got a real uh, responsibility also. I mean, I was really pleased and delighted last week when I was reading through our old university website in the manner in which the university has pledged that black lives do matter. And they really do matter. And the notion of the whole, the whole notion of black lives matter actually lies on the premise that there's a recognition that racism and discrimination and institutional discrimination actually does affect the lives of black and minority ethnic communities. And there's more research that needs to be done in that particular area. Thank you. Yeah, I would just, um, I was just gonna ask one, one of the, sort of add, add one of the questions in that we're getting in uh, right now in terms of just the way forward as a, a, con some, a kind of a closing statement from each of you, um, you know, we're we're at this moment. We're we're looking at the outcomes of this moment, but we know that they were preceded by you know outcomes that that were there before. And you know, what are the recommendations for addressing some of these structures? We've talked about the role of of researchers, but how do we deal with some of those structural issues that then the health outcomes are the end result of what we're seeing in terms of a, a larger process, what's the way forward? How do we leverage this conversation that we're having today? Can I come in there? Um, sure. So what I, just just on the point about what do we do in um, as academics and as researchers, and in relation to your last question um, as well, I think that um, for me, and, um, I, and I don't want to use the word decolonizing in a kind of, um, uh, a glib way because it's become like a, a mantra we're going to decolonize uh, uh, everything at the moment and I, I want it to mean what it really says which is to link where we are now with where we have been and where we've come from and to look at that long arc of history in terms of um, uh, the colonial context and how people were racialized how we the journey the migration journey to the UK um, and where we are now and how we are perceived and how we are policed and contained and controlled and the surveillance that goes on um, around our community. So I think unless we, we have in our curriculum in the universities and in our health training, an understanding of that historical context, it's going to be very hard for people to uh, and policymakers to really get to grips with how to move forward, because we need to know where those problems and issues have come from. So something like mental health in our uh, communities and the, um, in our, particularly in our Black and Caribbean communities, um, in our a amongst Asian women and the isolation that they experience, all those things come from cultural, historical, um, uh, deep-rooted issues. So I think we need that handle on history and i know kaneta you feel very strongly about history i too. endorse that 110 110 <laughs> um ivan did you want to offer any other uh, final comments particularly like i said you are you are one of the, the people on the front lines in a community uh, uh like that that we're we're a part of so that dmu is a part of so uh i'd, I'd love to hear any final comments that you might have 
Yeah, I, I think the, the main thing that I would say and would urge is that we cannot allow this moment to pass. The danger that we have here is people's memories are short. Doesn't matter how big it may feel, people's mm. memories are short. And we have to ensure that this is not considered to be something that relates to a particular infectious disease. We cannot let this be considered something that related to a particular case of social injustice. It is really important that we leave out this moment to talk to the wider issues of systemic and ongoing inequality. We have to use this time to do that. So start having those conversations. If you're in a if you're in an area, you can go across to your your health scrutiny to your I'm talking about my local authority point of view here so you can go to your health and well-being boards you can go it is it is going and asking these important questions local authorities have a role NHS has a role criminal justice has a role we need to be in there asking those questions to say so what has now happened are we just reverting back to I think it's really key at this moment that we grasp this opportunity the use of your research helps me helps us to be able to do that and that's where the power of it really lies it can't be just something that is an academic exercise it has to be something that relates to the reality that makes us better to be able to get change you know done within the, the transactional elements that are required for that change to come about um so that that would be my 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 points can I just come in there, though, because one of the things that happens is gets pushed back onto people of colour to make those changes, to keep the issues burning. And it's just we are just not a big enough group. I mean, there's so few um, black women professors. We have two here and there's 35 in the UK. You know, it can't be our responsibility. We need white allies. We really need white allies. We need people to come on board, not be afraid to ask questions um, and and to um, work with us. Yeah, I agree with that. On that note, we're going to um, just wrap up. I just want to thank our panelists one more time for a really fascinating discussion. Um, this is just sort of the, the first in many conversations that we want to have to bring airtime to these issues. People are, are hungry for information, hungry to have these conversations. Um, I'll just sort of share, I think we have a sort of closing slide real quickly uh, that I wanted to share in terms of um, directing people to resources at uh, the Stephen Lawrence Research Center site. Um, at uh, DMU and there we are also developing a set of resources that will build from these conversations to share some of the information um, as well that you can revisit on your own, some of the, the materials that were shared as a part of this conversation. And then the last thing that I wanted to do um, before we close with our audience today is that um, I want uh, to let you know that we do have the next seminar coming up um, called Education in the Time of Corona and that's going to take place on the 28th of June at 5 p.m. and we're going to be looking at sort of the impact of um, sort of the responses to COVID-19 on our educational system and we're going to be bringing together a panel of uh, uh, educators both at the secondary level but also in uh, higher education to look at the system um, and, and how do we navigate this moment and not exacerbate some of the inequalities that we're seeing um, that exist in the education system that, but that again are not isolated from um, things like healthcare, things like the criminal justice system and, and, and the larger social service network. Um, thank you all for joining us. And um, thank you to the panel again. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for having us. And I'm sorry that we didn't get to answer everyone's live questions and comments. But yes, we can see them and we'll we'll think about them <laughs> we can see them and we will try to use our web resources to um offer some uh some some ways to explore some of those questions that we weren't able to get to thank right. you very much thank, thank you, you. Thank thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.